Sunday morning, we stand and we sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace this is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Who brings the chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory, the King above all kings Whose the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me the grave, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, worthy is the King who conquered the grave, and worthy is the Lamb who was slain, worthy is the King who conquered the grave, and worthy is the Lamb who was slain, worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. You can have a seat. My name is Nick Erickson, and welcome to Redemption Church, where it's our mission and goal to encourage people to engage Christ with bold, life-changing purpose. If you're with us for the first time or you're online watching and you'd like to know how to connect with us, two ways you can do that. If you're here in person, 
We have a connection card in the lobby. If you want to fill one of those out, you can hand it to either one of the pastors or slide it in the offering box, and we'll engage you as quickly as possible. Or if you're at home or here and you have questions, you can text REDEMPTION to 94000. That's REDEMPTION to 94000. We'll do our best to respond as promptly as possible. But those are two easy, quick ways to connect with us. A couple things coming up. Um, we have a new uh, Sunday morning class starting up next week. It's called The Reason for God, Why the Christian Faith Still Matters. It's going to be starting next week in room 13, way in the back, um, during the second service. And so if you have uh, been a part of any of those classes before or you've not and you want to engage in this one, next Sunday, second service. With that, also a reminder that our GEMS class still meets every Sunday at 10 o'clock in the second service, and Russ Hadley leads that. So if you have questions, you can ask Russ. And then one final thing we want to share with you today is next week we have a fellowship meal and barbecue after the third service next week. Now, um, if you're coming, what we'd like you to do is go to our website and on the homepage fill out the I'm coming part so that way we know how many people to prepare food for. Now, if you're bringing food, by all means, do it. Um, but you don't have to. You're not required. But it would help us a lot if you could fill that out so we know how many people to, to account for. So homepage of our website Fill out the, for the meal, the barbecue meal, so we know how many people you're bringing it, and we're going to have a good time together next week. So we're just excited to worship Jesus this morning, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for all that you do for us, Lord, and I pray this morning as we hear from your word, as we sing praises to your name, Lord, that you are glorified among all other names, Lord. I pray that you continue to encourage us as we continue to seek you. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together again as we continue to worship. As we give glory to God.
says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and as for many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. We sing to an everlasting God, and we want to do that this morning.
Hey, Redemption. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nathan Brock. I'm a church planning resident at the church. And happy Mother's Day. I, uh, I've never been a mom myself, uh, nor have I come close. Uh, but we are really grateful uh, for the gift that mothers are uh, from God. I'm thankful to my own mom for a lot of things. Uh, one of them is when I was a kid, before I'd go to bed, she would read me uh, books, would read me a lot of stories. Now, she was especially fond uh, of reading books written by old, dead British guys. Some people call them classics. Um, but one of my favorites was the story of Peter Pan. Uh, J.M. Barry, author and playwright, uh, wrote this character into existence in the first decade of the 20th century. You may be more familiar with the 1953 movie, Peter Pan, released by Disney. Now, I love the story. And within it, we, we have a scene within the movie and in the, the books uh, of Peter coming to the darling children who live in London, and he comes into their bedroom, and he invites them to go with him to Neverland. Now, all they have to do is fly with him to the, the second star to the right and straight on to morning, right, if you, if you know the movie. Now, there's just, just one little catch, and it's having the ability to fly. Just a little thing. But luckily, Peter gives us the way uh, to obtain this gift of flight. And it involves a couple of things, right? So Peter's in the bedroom, and he tells the children, I'm imagining if I'm in the situation where he's saying, listen, all you need is faith. I would respond, that's great. I've got faith in bunches. I've got so much faith. Say, oh, yep, one more thing, says Peter. Uh, you're going to need trust. Okay, Peter, trust sounds remarkably similar to faith, but we'll go with it. I've got trust. I've got so much trust. And one more thing, says Peter, as he flies above, looking below. Uh, you're going to need my special, patented, limited supply of pixie dust. Well, now this is a pyramid scheme. Um, <laughs> He said all we need is faith, all we need is trust, but now he's trying to peddle his fairy sparkles onto us, right? He's going to ask us to go get our friends, and we'll sell them pixie dust, and it'll all, we'll all make millions. It'll be great. But we're not asking the question this morning as we come to our text. We're not asking the question of how do I fly. Rather, we're going to be asking a much more serious question. How am I saved? How am I saved? Because we're not trying to get to Neverland. We're trying, or our desire, is to be with God. So it's a much more serious question. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, to be saved, why do I need to be saved? Right? The, the need to be saved implies uh, the presence of danger. Maybe you don't feel any sense of danger in your life. So let me kind of give a, a preliminary consideration or, or set the stage a little bit for why we all need to be saved. I think there exists something that's self-evident to us and that's explicit when you read the Bible, in that that there is a good God. And this God created everything. Everything you see from the mountains over there to, to the salt lake and then everything, this entire world, this entire universe. And this God is good. He's morally perfect. Uh, he's relational. He uh, is in charge of everything. And he's perfectly just. He's perfectly just. So God created everything, which means he created you and me and everyone you know. But the reality is we need to be saved. Because you, me, and everyone we know rebels against God. Right? God is perfect and he has his perfect morals. But every single one of us rebel against God. We don't worship him, we worship ourselves. And because of our rebellion, we are separated from him. We're not in a loving relationship with him anymore because we've rejected him. So since we're in rebellion, we need to be saved into reconciliation with God. That's what we mean when we're asking the question, how am I saved? That's the need we have. And that's the answer the text is going to give us. So maybe uh, allow me to cheat a little bit and go ahead and give you the answer. How are we saved? How am I saved? 
I think the main point as we come to our text today is all we can do is believe in Jesus to be saved. But praise God, that's all we need. All we can do is believe in Jesus to be saved, but praise God, that's all we need. So our text this morning is going to be from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses uh, 5 to 13. Romans 10, 5 to 13. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to open it there. If you have the Bible app with you, I invite you to open it. <laughs> and if you don't have either, just go to your phone, go to your uh, browser, and type in Romans 10, verses 5 through 13, and type in ESV, because I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version this morning. And so let me, to get, let me give us kind of a roadmap to explore this main point. As we walk through the text, we're going to read a bit at a time, stopping to explain as we go, and we're going to answer these three questions while we're going. First, we're going to see, how am I not saved? Then, how am I saved? And finally, who can be saved? So that's our plan for this morning. Let's start in Romans 10, verses 5. I'm going to read verses 5 through 7. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. So these first few verses, I think, is giving us the, the question and the answer to how am I not saved? I think in our day and age, maybe our culture, maybe just the human condition, we are very fond of, of saying two statements. The first statement we'd like to say is, nobody's perfect. We say that all the time. And we also like to say, nobody can do everything. Nobody's perfect and nobody can do everything. Now, often these statements are said kind of in a posture of self-defense, right? You forget to take out the trash. Well, nobody can do everything. You accidentally let your rattlesnake loose in the shopping mall. Nobody's perfect, <laughs> right? Nobody's perfect and nobody can do everything. But even though we're saying these things in self-defense at a lot of times, I think there is some truth we're getting at. I think we're going to get that truth when we get, how am I not saved? So Paul here, writing to the church in Rome, starts by referencing Moses. Now, Moses is a, is a really big deal. Uh, you probably heard his name before. He was the leader of the Israelites as he brought them, as God brought them, out of Egypt and making their way to the promised land. And it was through Moses that God delivered his laws to his people. And Moses writes here in verse 5, Paul is referencing Moses writing about the righteousness that is based on the law. And the person who uh, does these commandments shall live by them. So the righteousness based on the law. What is righteousness? Well, last week, if, if you, if you want to go back later, Bobby gave us a really great definition of righteousness as moral perfection. Moral perfection. And, and this moral perfection, not doing anything wrong, doing everything right, is what is required to be with God in that loving relationship. That's what's required. And so here, the righteousness based on the law, um, it, it, for that to work, for that to take effect, for that to save you, you have to perfectly obey every one of God's commandments. That's the righteousness based on the law, doing everything perfect, following everything uh, crossing every T, dotting every I when it comes to following God. But here's the problem with that, with the righteousness based on the law. The Bible is clear, and we uh, experience this in our own lives, uh, that nobody's perfect, right? We say it all the time, but it's true. Nobody's perfect. Nobody follows God perfectly. So the righteousness based on the law it cannot save us because we are unable to follow God's morals perfectly. So how am I not saved? The first thing we are not saved is by doing everything right, by living perfectly. But then Paul goes on here, moving into verse 6. He, he kind of transitions from the righteousness based on the law, which can't save us because we're not good enough. And he starts talking about the righteousness based of faith. Now we're getting to the right track. 
Righteousness based on faith, that sounds more like what could save us, what could reconcile us to God. But before Paul says um, what the righteousness based on faith does say, he tells us what it doesn't say. So look again down there at verse 6. He says, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, right? That is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So the righteousness based on faith um, is, is telling us not to say these things in our heart. Now, what in the world do these mean? Do not ascend into heaven. Do not descend into the abyss. Well, it's really interesting here because Paul is referencing, if you were to go back in your Bible, to Deuteronomy 30. Now, in the timeline-wise, from when Paul is writing Romans, all the way back to Deuteronomy would be about 1,400 years. If you go back to Deuteronomy 30, you'll find Moses, once again, the Moses we know from this passage, um, talking to the Israelites. And actually, at this point, it's God communicating directly to the Israelites, to his people. And here God is saying, listen, in the future, there will be a time when I will come to you very intimately. You won't have to go searching for me, ascending into heaven. You won't have to go and try and find me, descending into the abyss. But I will be with you. God promises a time when he will give his people new hearts that follow God. So why is Paul referencing this here? Well, Paul is saying that what God said, what Deuteronomy was saying in the future tense back then, is now existing in the present tense. So the promised time when God would be with his people intimately is here now. And he says it because Jesus has come, right? So you don't have to go searching for God up, down, all around, because God has come to you. Jesus came. And now through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you very intimately, you can be with God, not having to go searching. It's like we said, uh, nobody can do everything. Nobody can find their own way to God. This being perfect and, and not being able to do everything, it reminds me of, of a couple illustrations. Where I remember when I was a kid, um, like in school, if you get work done, I'm just bored out of my mind, bored to tears. I'd just be sitting there playing with a pencil. And the, the objective would be to try and get the pencil to just balance on its tip, on the piece of lead right there on the desk. But no matter how much you tried, no matter how much you tried to balance it, you can't balance the pencil on its tip. It'll fall over. Maybe the a gust blows, somebody sneezes beside you, the weight's off just a little bit. Trying to be perfect, trying to do everything right to get to God, is like trying to balance a pencil on the tip. It's never going to work. It's too fine of margins. And we're not perfect enough. In the same way, we can't get to God by being perfect. We can't find our own way to God. That's not how we're saved. I think about this like, like a, f a plane flying overhead. As you look up and you see it soaring through the clouds, uh, you know, you don't, you're not able to jump up and touch that plane when it's so high above. I don't care how much you've spent on a fancy pair of shoes. These are $12.50 from Ross, so I'm obviously not touching that plane. You have to wait for the plane to come down to you in order to touch it. In the same way, we can't get to God on our own. We can't find our own way to God. We need God to come to us. Right? So that first point, that first question of how am I not saved? We are not saved by living perfect enough, and we are not saved by finding our own way to God. It's impossible. So, now let's move on to the next couple of verses where we're going to answer the question, how am I saved? How am I saved? So let's read verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, 
and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So how am I saved? What a question is that, right? This is the question that's plagued the mind of humanity since very near the beginning. This is the question that I hope you think about while you lay in bed at night looking up, <clears throat> looking at the ceiling or, or the fan going around. How am I saved? We know God is good. We know we are not. We know we are in rebellion. We know we need to be reconciled. So how am I saved? Um, so today, there is, maybe it's new, maybe it's not, a really big emphasis on the power of uh, manifestation, of manifesting your future. So the, the thought here is that by thinking about something hard enough and believing it enough and almost speaking it into existence, somebody, through the power of belief, can make their dreams come true, can change reality by believing hard enough. Now, to be sure, this um, manifesting your future, it has its home in New Age spirituality and not in Christianity. However, I do think there is something true about the power of belief. But it's not about believing and accomplishing your dreams. I don't want to, uh, I, I want to change that belief because it's not about uh, believing in yourself. It's about believing in Jesus. Right, so here uh, Paul goes on talking about how we are saved because the righteousness of faith does say the word is near you. So this is kind of referencing back what we were just talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of Deuteronomy 30 where God would, was saying, I will be with you. Well, Paul is saying, well, God is here with you. Jesus has come. The word is near you. He is accessible through the gospel message. So you don't have to go searching for God. Like we said, he's here. And it's through the righteousness based on faith. So how we are saved, Paul gives two things. Believing and confessing. Believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. Let's start with, with believing. Uh, so this believing in your heart is something much more than just some sort of intellectual assent. Believing in Jesus involves much more than the mind. It is a deep commitment, convictional, volitional belief in Jesus. So be believing in Jesus, how we are saved, is not just being able to, to kind of get a test on Christianity, get an 80%, turn it in, and get to heaven. It's not about having the knowledge per se, but it's about believing in a deep, loving way in Jesus. But actually, Paul goes on, in addition to believing, he talks about confessing. So confessing with your mouth is also how we are saved. Now hold on. You may be asking yourself the question right now, uh, isn't that something additional? If we went back to that main point, didn't, didn't you say that all we can do is believe in Jesus? Is confessing some sort of work? It may seem when you read this passage that confession Confessing Jesus is something like the, the pixie dust we have to sprinkle on top of our belief in order to make it valid. But I contend to you that confessing Jesus is not something in addition to belief. It's not something additional. Rather, confessing Jesus is the proof of real belief. Think about it this way. So in, in, in college, one of my favorite Saturday activities was cliff jumping. So we would drive out, out of the town, go to a river where there's a cliff next to it, and what we would do is climb up the side of the cliff, get to the top, and jump into the cool water below. It was super fun. Great thing to do with friends. Now, one of these times, I, I, you know, doing cliff jumping, I climbed to the middle of the cliff and kind of traversed over to the side. Now, I wasn't super high, maybe 10 or, or so feet above the water, but I just did something super cool, right? I did a swan dive into the water. It was beautiful. If you would have seen it, you would have think that guy's going to the Olympics because that was a perfect 10. And I felt really cool doing it. Um, but I guess I had traversed a little too far on the cliff because as I dove into the water and the refreshing uh, coolness hit me, I got smack, boulder to the face. Yeah, it was stupid. Like, 
Don't dive into water you, you have never jumped into before. I do not recommend it. Now, I was okay. I came up, had a, a gash, a big bump, and everyone's like, what happened? I was like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, you know? Just keep having fun. But let me, let me think about the mechanics of what happened there, right? I dove into the water. I hit the boulder with my face. I felt the pain internally, and luckily, the water deadened my screams of agony, <laughs> right? Nobody heard it. I still kept my, my pride. So what happened is I, I felt the pain, and I expressed it through a scream. In the same way, with belief, you hear about the news of Jesus, you believe it internally, and the natural outworking of it is to confess it verbally. It's not like this is something in addition to your belief. Rather, it's the evidence of true belief. In the same way that a scream is the evidence of smacking a boulder with your face. It goes together. So what, how are we saved, right? It is believing in Jesus that outworks itself in confessing. That's all we can do. As so many people believe in manifesting their future, believe in their self, we, for their future, we believe in Jesus for our future. So, so I, I want to be super clear here. I want to slow down for a moment because this question of how am I saved is the biggest question you can ever ask yourself. The answer is believing that Jesus was the Son of God who became a human lived a perfect life, and died on the cross in your place. And if you believe in him and turn from your rebellion, through Jesus, you are reconciled to God. That's how I am saved. So if you take one thing from this passage, from this sermon, take that. So let's finish up with the last few verses here where we're going to be asking and answering the question of who can be saved? Who can be saved? So let's read 11 through 13, finishing up. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right, so we're asking and answering who can be saved. You know, um, we are super fond, or, or actually we are averse, uh, to speaking in absolutes, to speaking in definite terms. Think about when you try and throw a party, right? You, you kind of ask somebody you know to go to the party. You're like, hey, man, uh, we're having just a little thing, a little get-together in our place on the 15th. We'd love if you can make it. How do they respond? It's always, oh, I, I might be able to come. That guy doesn't have anything going on on the 15th. He just doesn't want to give you a definite answer, just in case something better comes along. We are, we are scared of speaking in definites and absolutes. But hear this, friend. God is not afraid of speaking definitely, of speaking absolutely. And he does that here when he talks about who can be saved. Um, so it says, you know, everyone who believes in Jesus or who believes in him will not be put to shame. This shame here, uh, what, what does that mean? Is this like embarrassment? Are we saved from embarrassment when we believe in Jesus? Um, is being saved to God like being able to avoid that dream where you go to school in your underwear? Like you don't get embarrassed if, if you believe in Jesus. No, it's actually something more serious. Where this shame is talking about eternal separation from the loving relationship with God and actually experience. Uh, spending eternity in God's just wrath. But if you believe in Jesus, you're saved from that shame. And he goes on to say, listen, God is Lord over all, over everyone who exists, over Jew and Greek. Now, we may not understand maybe the, the, the difference between Jew and Greek that would uh, exist in the original context. But for this time period, being a Jew and a Greek was about as different as you can be. Even when Paul is writing to Rome here, he's probably writing in Rome, uh, writing to Rome in A.D. 57. A.D. 57. But it's helpful for us to know, I think, 
If you go back eight years earlier to AD 49, the Roman historian Suetonius actually records that all the Jews were kicked out of Rome in AD 49. The history books say because of, or the history writing from the, the time actually say, because of a dispute over a man named Christus. That's Jesus Christ. So in 49 AD, all the Jews were kicked out of Rome because people were arguing about Jesus. But when Paul is writing eight years later, the Jews have come back in. So this church that Paul is writing to, for a time, they were only Greeks. And now, they're Greeks and Jews. This probably existed, or probably um, resulted in a lot of division within the church. Arguments about what it is to be saved. Arguments about what laws we follow. Arguments about heritage. But Paul is saying, listen, no matter your background, no matter your heritage, no matter your previous beliefs, no matter uh, your ethnicity, no matter anything, God is Lord over all. Right? So there's no distinction here between Jew and Greek. Because Paul gives us, uh, quoting from Joel 2 actually, he gives us maybe the most exciting verse in the entire Bible. There's a lot of them, but this one's up there. Saying that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone who calls. So it's, it's kind of not just a sitting back, passive belief, what Paul is talking about. This is a call. This is somebody um, speaking to Jesus, saying, like, I need you, Jesus. So there's kind of this, this action that's taking place in the person. But it's everyone. Anybody can do it. This everyone language, it makes me think about um, anytime anybody's giving directions, it could be anything. If you're giving directions about uh, picking up trash in the parking lot, there's always going to be that person who asks a million hypothetical questions, right? Now, I don't want to call these people annoying, but these annoying people, they ask all of these hypothetical questions when you're just trying to give directions, right? So you can say, all right, everybody, I want you to go into the parking lot and just pick up all the trash. Somebody's going to raise their hand, and they're going to say, yep, got a question for you. Uh, what if it's a water bottle? You can pick up the water bottle, okay? They raise their hand again. I have another question. What if the water bottle is filled with rocks? You can dump out the rocks and throw away the water bottle, right? I mean, it's just a hypothetical question. One more, one more. What if the water bottle has a gun, has taken a hostage, and refuses to go quietly? Then do not engage. I repeat, do not engage the water bottle, right? These are a million hypothetical questions you can ask in this scenario. But when you come to the question of who can be saved, you can ask as many hypothetical questions as you want. The answer will always be the same. What if I've lived a pretty rough life up to this point? Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. What if I grew up in a different belief system? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What if I don't dress the right way, eat the right food, sing the right songs, drive the right car, have the right job, have a perfect family. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So maybe we don't like speaking in absolutes. Maybe we don't give definite answers all the time. But here, God is sure to give the definite answer of who can be saved? Everyone. Everyone who calls on Jesus. That's who can be saved. So let's go back to Peter Pan for a second, right? We were talking about the faith and the trust and the pixie dust. There are a lot of pixie dusts in this world when it comes to how can I be saved. There's a lot of things we think we need to sprinkle on top of our lives in order to get to God. It's, it's every other belief system in the world besides Christianity says you need to do certain things to get to God. Certain things to add on top, right? But hear me, friend, this is not Peter Pan. It doesn't take pixie dust to be saved. All it takes is faith. All it takes is belief. We're not asking how to fly or to get to Neverland. We're asking how can I be saved? How can I get to God? 
So I want to get really personal here as we're, we're coming to the end. I think about those three questions once more, and um, yeah, I get really personal with it, where how am I not saved, right? We're not saved by living perfect enough. We're not saved by making our own way to God. So think about your life. Um, are you finding your worth before God based on how well you're living? That's not how we're saved. Are you trying to find your own way to God, searching high and low when God has come to you in Jesus? How am I saved? Know that the only way you can be saved is by believing in Jesus, and the result is confessing Jesus with your mouth. I want to give an open invitation here. If, if you have any questions about that question, about believing in Jesus, I will buy you coffee this week to talk about it some more, even if you disagree with me. I would love to talk about it and walk through what Scripture says about who is Jesus. I'll even buy you lunch if you're really nice to me. And then who can be saved, right? Maybe you think you're on the outside looking in. Maybe you think this isn't for you. God says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Forget the pixie dust. It's all about faith. Remember the main point as we go from here. All we can do is believe in Jesus to be saved. But praise God, that's all we need. Let's pray as we close. God, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for your word. We thank you for communicating how we can be saved to you. Thank you for your love for us. We pray that we, uh, we feel your realness, that we respond uh, to your word, and that we believe in Jesus, and that we go from here, if we do believe in Jesus, confessing him to all the world that's watching. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nathan. Um, this morning as we close, if you, uh, like he said, if you have questions, if you need uh, answers, we'd love to speak with you. Our pastors will be in the lobby there um, as we finish up this morning. Let's stand. So we sing about the mercy that we have in God. <laughs>
Have a great week.